Good morning, folks. Please turn to the book of Acts. We will be in chapter 26 this morning. Paul before Agrippa. You know, it's funny. Here is a great man of God, someone that I think most of us at least wish we could be like. We may not be like the Apostle Paul, but we sure wish we could be. He's done nothing wrong except trying to live for God, just trying to live out his faith. Took it to his brothers. They didn't want to listen. In fact, he kind of wanted to stay with his brothers, but the Lord told him his mission and his calling was going to be to the Gentiles. So he went on and took uh, that message to the Gentiles. And um, as long as he stayed with the Old Testament, as long as he stayed with the things that everyone could identify with and agree with, then uh, they were all yes and amen. But the minute he brought Jesus into the mix, the minute he began to talk about death and resurrection, even though they professed it, they didn't really believe in it. And so when he began to profess Jesus' death and resurrection, that got him into a lot of trouble. Now, where are Christians supposed to stand in all that's going on? What happens if terrorism strikes more and more in the USA? And it's going to, by the way. You just, you, we just need to know that it, it, it will. It's not to be afraid of, but it will. Uh, Israel has been dealing with this, these acts of terrorism for years and years and years. And... Um, other places around the, around the world. America, not so much. But uh, what's going on around the country, around the world, is uh, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. We are being pretty much infiltrated <laughs> from the outside in, and there's really not much we're doing about it. I started to say there's really not much we can do about it, but I don't know if that's completely true. It's almost as though we've given up doing anything about it or the decisions that we're making. Um, you know, I, I get, let, let me say in defense of the government, I wouldn't want the job. Any president that takes over, regardless of your political affiliation, that's not really the message this morning. Any president that takes over, he takes over for another president who took over for another president who took over for another president who took over for another president. And each one has to come in and uh, clean up, if you will. Has to kind of clean up the messes or try to clean up the messes that were handed down to them. And then try to make the, the best decisions that they can. Now, I'm not going to defend or berate. I'm just saying that we look at things from the outside, and it's kind of like playing sports on Sundays when you're a, an armchair athlete. You can see everything that's going on. You can see all the mistakes, and you can yell at the coaches, and you can tell them it's a dumb mistake. But when you're out there in the heat of it, you're out there in the middle of it, it's a different story. But what I will say is that America is not now the America it was 25 years ago, 10 years ago. We know that uh, these cases are going to increase, and uh, it makes you wonder of the things that were plotted or tried that were found out and taken care of that we never know anything about. Now, where do we stand as Christians? What are we supposed to do? I wrote the other day on Facebook, God's not a Republican and he's not a Democrat. So many times Christians think that Jesus is a Republican. <laughs> well, he, he's not. He's not. And we need to know that. Um, you might think, well, he leans a lot more toward... He, I don't think he leaned anywhere. I think we've just kind of picked and chosen and said, you know, this is what I believe, therefore let's fit it in. And I'm not saying that there's not a lot of things here to be concerned about. But we need to be more concerned about Jesus than we are anything else. We need to know and understand that the salvation of our country comes through prayer. It comes through dedication. It comes through evangelizing. It comes through telling people about Jesus. Not just necessarily complaining, although we may feel like we've got a lot to complain about. 
But one thing that the gospel does, one thing that Christianity does is, and I know this is going to run contrary to what most of us feel, is that it divides. It divides. The gospel, even though it's good news, good news is not always easy news to hear. And like I have said in the, in the last teaching or so, that we find ourselves in a place to where we want to all get along, but we can't all get along. And you have to balance this, this thing out that we're constantly dealing with, and that is, I'm a pacifist. We're, as Christians, I, I believe there's a, a certain pacifism that goes along with Jesus Christ, but there's a certain border or boundary that you can't, pass. In other words, there are a lot of things not worth fighting over, but Jesus is worth fighting over. And when you bring the gospel down and you narrow it down past all the feel-good feelings, there comes a time when you got to tell people about Jesus. Today we've washed out God, and I'll put, I'll put it in quotes because you can believe in God without being a Christian. You can make up your own God. And we've done that. We've pretty much taken a God who just is mamby-pamby, milk toast, doesn't stand for anything. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have wealth and health and be prosperous. But we leave out the fact that we have to be confronted with our sins. We have to be confronted with our sins. We have to come to a place where at some point in time, if you are witnessing to your family or to your friends, you may start soft, but you've got to eventually come to a place of, do you want to pray to receive Jesus Christ? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you have to, you have to give up. You have you, you got to die. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Maybe I'm not quite ready for that. So what ends up happening is we end up backpedaling. We end up soft selling. But sooner or later, there has to be that confrontation. So my point is this. Christianity, uh, Christians are going to be more and more hated. Christianity is going to be hated more and more. Because there's so many other religions out there that you can mix together and you can just say everything's good and everything's fine. Can't we all just get along because you really stand for absolutely nothing? But that's not the truth for the Bible. That's not the truth for Christianity. There are certain things that cannot be compromised. From John Corson, he said, Noah didn't stand at the steps of the ark and say, something good is about to happen to you. Amos was not confronted by priests who threatened to kill him because he was preaching, I'm okay, you're okay. Jeremiah was not cast into the dungeon because he was talking about the power of possibility thinking. Daniel was not thrown into the lion's den for saying, smile, God loves you. John the Baptist wasn't beheaded for having a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. And the message of Noah and Daniel and Amos and Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, was one singular message. You know what it was? Repent. Repent. That is the message that needs to be given to our nation, to our friends. Now, I'm not saying you, you, you have a big sign painted in blood and you put it on their front lawn that says, Repent. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about radicalizing. I'm talking about lovingly telling folks this is the step that needs to be taken. There's one God, we're not Him. We need to reconcile with Him. And the only way to reconcile with God is to repent of our sin. And I shared this with you last week. Um, the gospel will not be a popular message. Again, this is from John Corson. Because people who think they've got it together you have to tell them they don't. And people who think that they're okay, we have to tell them that they're not okay. And people who think they'll be able to get to heaven on their own, we have to tell them that they cannot get to heaven on their own. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We live in a very complicated world. In fact, 
I know of several people even over the last week have talked about fear. And that is the greatest threat of terrorism. It's not even really losing our life. It's the fear of losing our life. It's the fear of speaking up. It's the fear of standing up for justice, for fear that we might be persecuted. Or fear that we might actually die for our, our faith. That's the true act of terrorism. That, that it takes away our freedom as Americans. But Father, we also know and understand that there is really no freedom without you. We know that our leaders need you. We know that we need you. And Father, I feel from the bottom of my heart, there's never been a more appropriate time for us as Christians to be serious about our faith, to be in love with you above all things, to be sharing our faith with as many as will possibly listen. So Father, as we listen to your word this morning, and we see Paul in a precarious situation, and we see what seems like a real mistake on his part. But Lord, we know that you guided him, you directed him, and he knows and feels that this is an opportunity that you've given to him, even though it may bring persecution to him, he feels like this is a moment that you've given him to be able to tell his brethren about you, to tell the whole world about you. So, Father, we give ourselves to you this morning that you might teach us, you might open our ears and open our hearts, that we might hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, he's been accused of treason. He's been uh, accused of uh, crimes against the state. Treason, of course, would be that. But he hasn't done anything. We know that deep down inside he hasn't done anything at all. But truth is highly overrated for a lot of people. There's a, a joke that I used to tell a guy that used to go to our church long ago, and he and I would joke about this. And that was, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And that's the way most of the news channels are today. Truth is really uh, secondary. It's third down the line. It, it's not really uh, important to folks. They just need to be able to get in. They need to be able to sell the story. So truth right now, when I say it's overrated, it's overrated by a lot of folks. But truth is still the truth. Paul is living in the truth. Paul is innocent. But they don't care if he's innocent. They really don't care if he's innocent because they have a story to tell. And that's where we pick it up. Look at 26 verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and he answered for himself. First time he's really had an opportunity to really speak, to be able to, to say what's on his mind. He's been able to let out a few words here and there, but they've cut him off. And now he's going to give him an opportunity to be able to speak. Now, you're going to notice that this is not a defense of himself. He's not really going to get up. He, he is going to say, I haven't done anything wrong. But he really, his intention is not to get up and consider everything of how he can get out of this because you and I already know that Paul doesn't care whether he gets out of it or not. His main concern is to be able to tell everybody who's in attendance about Jesus Christ. Look at verses 2 and 3. I think myself happy, King Agrippa. Now when he says, I think myself happy, that's not like, hey, I think I'll think myself happy. I'm happy today because I'm thinking positively. That's not what he means. He's basically saying, I'm very glad that I get an opportunity to be able to speak to you. So I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Now, Agrippa is half Jew, and he's half Edomite. And Paul knew that he had done at least an intellectual study of Judaism. So Paul at least knows he can speak to him on a certain level, and he will understand. Have you ever had somebody come up and speak to you in English, but in a language you couldn't understand? 
You see it on TV all the time where they turn to the coroner and they say, what did you find? And he goes into all these $5 words, medical words, and they say, okay, now put it in English for me so I can understand. It may not have been all English, may have been some Latin in there with the coroner, but you know what I mean. Somebody comes up to you and they begin to speak. Sometimes uh, people talk in tech or the same way. They just assume everybody talks tech and they understand what you're talking about, but it's just kind of, it just doesn't go anywhere. He knew that Agrippa would at least understand what he was saying and what he was talking about. So he says, I'm really glad that I have you here this morning that I might be able to tell these things too. And then he begins. Look at verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning amongst my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. In other words, this is not something that's hidden. This has been out in the open. The Jews know me. They know who I am. I was there consenting and holding the coats when they stoned Stephen. They know who I am. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Paul elsewhere says he was not just a Pharisee, but a Pharisee of Pharisees. Born to the tribe of Benjamin, on and on, and he goes on and on and on saying, I studied, I was at the top of my class, as far as Pharisees goes. I was the up and coming. I was the rock star of being a Pharisee. So he says, everybody knows who I was. And look at verse 6. He says, and now I stand, and I am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. He's going all the way back into the Old Testament and saying, God promised us a Messiah. People have been waiting. People have been hoping for the Messiah. I have been hoping and waiting for the Messiah. And he's saying, now I'm being judged because I'm telling you that hope is here. That that hope is Jesus Christ. He hasn't quite gotten there yet, but let's take a look again. Look at, let's reread verse 6. Now I stand and I'm being judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Verse 7. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God day and night, hope to attain. Hope to attain. Now guys, you might want to underline that. Hope to attain. And I want to ask you a question. And don't, don't lift your hands or anything. <clears throat> but are you sitting here this morning hoping to attain? Are you sitting here this morning hoping you will get to heaven? Not being 100% sure. Not knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to get to heaven, but you're sitting here hoping to attain. Do you realize churches are full all over the world this morning with people that are hoping to attain? You might think, well, why are they just hoping to attain? Well, because they've been told they have to be good, and you can't be good. They've been told they have to be righteous, and they can't be righteous on their own. They've been told that the good has to outweigh the bad, and as they survey all of that in their head and they calculate it and total it all up, they're not sure. So they sit in churches this morning hoping to attain. But Christians, those who have given their life to Jesus Christ, our hope is not to attain. Our hope is the one who has already attained. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the one who's already given and sacrificed and became sin for us all, that he might free all of us. Paul is speaking to his brethren, the Jews, and those who have been persecuting him and saying they hope to attain. You know what? In his nation, many, if not most of the nation, is still hoping to attain. They haven't accepted Jesus Christ. They don't accept him as the Lord and Savior, and they're still waiting for a Messiah. And they've completely missed that the Messiah is here. We make it so complicated. 
I remember as a young man thinking about God and wondering who God was. And I had heard about Jesus, but I thought, that's too simple. It can't, that can't be. It's got to be one of those holy guys sitting on a mountain with his legs crossed. It's got to be something foreign. It's got to be out there. I have to go chasing. I have to go find it. I have to go to the end of the world and find out who God is. And for many people, they said in church on Sundays, God is presented to them, but they leave hoping to attain. Verse 7, to this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God day and night hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. I'm accused by the Jews because I've told them where that hope is. I've told them who that hope is. Verse 8, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? You see, that's why it got him in trouble last time. He was good as long as they could say amen to everything. But when he talked about Jesus being raised for the dead, they freaked out. They couldn't handle it. But yet, I want you to understand what an oxymoron this is. They, I don't know if that's even an oxymoron. But anyway, it's a funny word and I like to use it. But if you go all the way back into the Jewish history, that's, that's what they, they lived for day and night, right? They were waiting for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah. Now, when he comes along, or when Paul comes along, when Jesus comes along, and it actually happens, they won't believe it. They, they won't believe in the resurrection from the dead. How else was God going to do this? Evidently, whatever they had pictured in their mind, it didn't happen that way. And we know that even the disciples were, again, figuring Jesus was going to overthrow Rome. So who knows what was going in their mind and what they expected. But Jesus has risen from the grave. And as soon as he said that, he got himself in trouble. But he knows that Agrippa understands his concept. He understands, he knows that, uh, that Agrippa understands the Jewish history. So he's saying, this shouldn't be weird for you. This shouldn't be something that, that is a foreign concept for you. Paul goes on to say that he persecuted Christians because he didn't get it. Why is it that we're so afraid of the things we do not understand? Why is it that for some people, if you mention science fiction, they think, you can't believe in life on other planets. You can't believe in this. You can't believe in that because it goes completely against Christianity. Well, does it? Does all of it? There used to be a song years ago that said, if uh, there's life on other planets, then I'm sure that he must know, and he's been there already to save their souls or something like that. I think I missed a couple of words there. But why is it that we, we put God in this little bitty box of what we think he can do or what we think he cannot do, and anything beyond that, we can't possibly fathom. We can't possibly put it in our heads, even though we may have been hoping for it all along. That's where they're at. You might be there this morning. You might be really inside hoping that there's a God. <clears throat> you might be hoping that there is truly salvation, that there's truly freedom and forgiveness for the things that have happened in your past. And yet, at the end of the service, when the gospel message is given and the challenge is given, you might not even receive Jesus Christ. Why is it that we do that? Why is it that we get ourselves to a place to where we're hoping and we're praying, but when we're presented, we turn it down? Let's move on. Look at verse 9. He says, indeed, I thought myself, or I myself thought, that I must do many things Contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison. Having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. And compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Do you know that ISIS has regularly and continually beheads people? They cut their heads off. And in a lot of cases, when they go into a village, they line the children up. 
and the children are the ones that they behead first so that the parents have to watch it. And the only way they get out of it is to denounce Christianity, to denounce Jesus Christ and profess a whole new faith. The only way they get out of it. That's a whole lot of hate. Paul says, this is who I was. I held the coats of people while they stoned folks to death. I cast, I cast my vote against them. I went out looking for them. I, I rallied them in. I herded them in like a bunch of animals. And I persecuted them because I thought I was doing God a favor. The war going on now and the thing that faces us the most is another group of individuals who believe that they are doing God a favor. They honestly believe that they're doing God a favor. Now, I'm not saying that there's not corruption in there. There's a whole lot of sin in there, but they vehemently believe that they're doing their God a favor. Now, I don't agree with any of the tactics. I don't agree with any of the hate. But would that Christians would feel so strongly about their God? Would that we would love our God so intently that trying to do His will would be all that we want and all that we think about? I think our world would be a different place. It's amazing how much a few Christians who are filled with the Spirit praying, how much they can accomplish and what all can be done in those lives and to the people's lives around them. So, he said, you know, this is what I used to do. And then look at verse 12. He says, while thus occupied, while I was doing all of this, in other words, I wasn't looking for Jesus. I was looking for the ones who professed Jesus. And I was looking for them so that I could rail them in and so that I could kill them or at least put them in jail to get rid of this whole Christian thing. And he says, while I was thus occupied, while I was in the middle of doing all of this stuff, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Now these are the chief priests, these are some of the ones that are so upset with him. He says, I was under the authority. I had a commission. I got permission, a written law for me to go after these people. And he says, while I was doing this, on the road to Damascus at midday, noon, sun shining, bright, brighter than the sun, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. Now, we're from Arizona. We know what that means. Midday, we know how bright the sun is. And he says, he saw a light that was brighter than the sun. And it was shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Saying, Saul, why, why are you doing this? Have you ever goaded anyone? Anybody use those terms any, anymore? It used to be a term, and uh, it basically means pestering or riling someone up. you goading them. Well, they would make these sticks. They were dealing with oxen, and oxen are not exactly smartest animals in the world. And they would make these sticks, and they would sharpen them on the end, and the oxen, get them to go, they would goad them. They would poke them to try to get them to move, right? So he's saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Isn't it hard for you to kick against the goads? Now, This is important, and you guys have heard me say this over and over again, but look at 15. So I said, here's a man that thinks he's on a mission from God, doing God a favor, but when God shows up, what does he say? Who are you, Lord? Who are you? 
I wonder how many people today who claim to be Christians, if Jesus showed up and said these words, they would say, who are you? Who are you? Well, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, you can read all about me. I have this little book called the Bible. And you can read a whole bunch about me. You can find a whole bunch out about me and my character in there. Who are you, God? And he doesn't mince words. He doesn't uh, flower this up. He doesn't camouflage it in any way. What does he say? I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Verse 16, he says, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. So Paul's saying, Agrippa, I used to feel exactly the same way my persecutors do. They know full well who I was and what I did. But something changed. You ever had a chance to witness to your family and tell them about your conversion experience? If you're like me, my family spread out all over the place. And I remember there came a time when I needed to sit down and write them a letter. And uh, I basically did my best to explain to them my road to Damascus experience. And what had happened to me. Because it was very, very difficult to be able to put that verbally. But I found that writing it, I was able to put it down a little more clearly. I was able to express myself a little more clearly. And he's telling them, I used to feel exactly the same way, but something happened to me. I had an experience with God, and that experience with God has changed me forever. I found out the God that I was running from was actually the one I was persecuting. It was Jesus Christ. And because of that, I have changed. My life is different. You know what? I believe that this testimony needs to be given to our families by every single one of us. If you haven't told them about your conversion experience, tell them. You say, well, maybe they'll reject me. That's okay. It's nothing that Jesus hasn't suffered already. If you can't share it with them verbally, write the letter. Tell them what has happened in your life. As a result of that, I've got to see about four or five of my family come to know Jesus Christ. Because at the end, I just told them, if you ever want to know more about this, I'd love, to, I'd love to share it with you. And I remember one of my sisters calling me one night, and she goes, you know what you wrote in the letter? And they, this, by this time, it had been a couple months. And I'm saying, yeah, I think so. She goes, I'm ready. I said, you're ready? What are you ready for? Because <laughs> I'm ready to pray to receive Jesus Christ. You just never know what the Lord is going to do. But we need to make sure we tell our family that something changed, something happened in us. Guys, Paul was persecuting Jesus. He didn't even know who he was. So it's not like he was in heavy pursuit of God. It wasn't like he was trying to find out who God was. He was just missing a few key elements. He submitted his life to the Lord when the Lord finally overshadowed him and said, you know, I'm Jesus. And he finally listened. It finally broke. What does it take to break us? I know that as my kids were growing up, I used to think, what's it going to take for God to get your attention? And it's a scary thing. As a parent, it is a scary thing because on one hand, you love your kids. You want to protect them at all costs. You want them to have a life that you didn't have. Uh, You know, it's hard to express how much you care about them. But on the other hand, as a Christian, you have to say this prayer. God, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to get their attention that they might come to know you. Now, here you are as a parent. Wow. How do I do that? Now, let me ask you a question. And this is pretty serious business, and I understand it's pretty serious business. Wouldn't it be better for our sons or daughter to receive Jesus Christ two minutes before they die than to live their entire life in sin and never come to know Jesus Christ? God, 
do whatever it takes. When my brother, Lonnie, came to know the Lord, he struggled with alcohol for years and years and years. He's a good guy, meant to do well, got caught up in high school and began to drink, and he was a mean drunk. And he just messed up his first marriage and lost and lonely. And I remember that uh, he had lost another job, and I've shared this with some of you guys, lost another job, didn't have any money, couldn't pay his rent, so we invited him to come and live with us. And there was only one rule, don't drink. Well, he did. And uh, my wife was pregnant. She was having contractions that night, and I get a call from a cop that says, you got to come and get your brother. Well, now what do I do? <laughs> my wife is in labor. She's having contractions. We both have to drive down. If I'm going to go get my brother, we both have to drive down because I've got to drive his car. I've got to drive it back. I should have never been put in that position. But that's what an addict does, whether they intend to or not. They put other people in jeopardy. They jeopardize other friendships and other families and other lives. On the way home with my brother, even though he was drunk, I, I was preaching to him all the way home, and before we got all the way home, he asked, what do I need to do? And we pulled over to the side of the road, and I prayed with him to receive Jesus Christ. What I told him afterwards was that many months ago, I had prayed the prayer, God, I turn him over to you for the destruction of the flesh that his soul might be saved. You might go, wow, that's a harsh prayer. It was a very harsh prayer. In fact, my brother goes, you said what? <laughs> but you know, sometimes the flesh has got to be destroyed. Sometimes people can't overcome the flesh. They just continue in the flesh. And I think sometimes as parents, we have to pray those hard prayers. God, do whatever you got to do. Whatever you got to do. Humble them. So they come to the place where they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God went out of his way with Paul. Paul wasn't looking, but he told him, I'm the one that you are persecuting. In Acts 26, verse 18, it says, To open the eyes in order to turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. Why do you think Paul is telling them this? To condemn them? To hurt them in any way? I wasn't doing, I didn't say that prayer about my brother because I didn't love him. I said it because I did love him. I wasn't trying to hurt him. I was trying to have him give his life to Jesus Christ, to have a fullness of life, which by the way, he has had. He has had. He's living a happy life in the Lord as a result of him giving his life to the Lord. Paul is not worried about what's going on here. Paul is not worried about his chains. Paul is worried about his people. Paul wants to tell them about forgiveness. He wants to tell them what's going on. But now Festus thinks he's nuts. You see, Festus is a Roman. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. So he says, Paul, you, you, you've had bad pizza or something because you're crazy. You're speaking, you're, speaking, you're speaking kind of crazy here. But he knows that Agrippa's hearing what he says. Look at verse 20, uh, chapter 26, verse 24. He says, Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Okay, that means you're nuts. Meaning, excuse me, much learning has driven you mad. Paul, we're not saying you're not a smart guy, but you're, but, you're, but you're crazy. 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. I'm trying to speak words of truth and wisdom to you. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these 
things escapes his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner, King Agrippa has seen all of this. He knows what's going on. And then he says, here it comes. Here's the final, here's where it, you know, the rubber meets the road. Look at 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Now, I would think Agrippa's probably going, Paul, I'm not on trial here. But he knows exactly what question to ask Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? Then he turns around and he says, I know that you believe the prophets. Then what does Agrippa say to Paul? Agrippa says to Paul, and please underline this, you almost, underline the word almost, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul, you're crazy. Yeah, he's crazy like a fox. He knew that Agrippa had studied. He knew what Paul was talking about. But here's the problem, guys. Here's the problem. Almost. Almost. I want to quote something to you from J. Vernon McGee on the book of Acts. He says, friend, do you know that you can almost be a Christian and then be lost for time and eternity? How tragic is this? Almost will not do. It must be all or nothing. Either you accept Christ or you don't accept Christ. No theologian could probe the depths of salvation and its meaning. Yet it is simple enough for ordinary folks like most of us to understand. Either you have Christ or you don't have Christ. Either you trust in Christ or you don't trust Christ. Either He is your Savior or He is not your Savior. It is one or the other. There is no such thing as middle ground. I cannot be almost. It must be all. So when you're sitting here this morning, have you got yourself convinced that almost is okay? That almost is good enough for now? When I get older, when I get too old to have fun sinning, then maybe, maybe I'll come to know Jesus when I'm all done. You know what? That's an almost. That's not a one or the other. That is an almost. People might say, well, I accepted Jesus when I was a kid. Well, are you living for Jesus Christ? When you accepted Jesus as a, as Christ as a kid, that was probably a, an all. But what about now? Is it an all or is it an almost? If Jesus came back today, could you say, well, I accepted Jesus. I accepted you when I was six or seven. Well, did you? then why aren't you walking with me now? Are you sure that that's good enough? When right now it's, you're not? When right now it's just an, an almost? Maxwell's smart. I missed it by that much. <laughs> Everybody over 40 just laughed. <laughs> Acts 26, 29, and Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might both almost and altogether be such as I am except for these chains. Agrippa says, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I pray to God, I wish to God that not only you, but every single person in here would become as I am, that they would give their life to Jesus Christ, that they would become a Christian today and be like I am, except for these chains. I don't wish that on them, but I wish that they had the fullness that is in Jesus Christ. You know what, guys? That's my prayer every single Sunday, every single Wednesday. I know it's Pastor Dan's. That every single person within earshot and on the Internet that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what we gather for. That's why we do this. That's why you give towards the ministry is so that we can tell people about Jesus Christ and people can be set free. Look at verse 30. When he had said these things, 
The king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Huh. He's done nothing. Now you've both said that he has done absolutely nothing. Then Agrippa says to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Might. Might and almost. All of a sudden it looks like Paul blew it. All of a sudden it looks like Paul, you really made a mistake here. If you hadn't appealed to Caesar, this guy might have, they might have just gotten together and let you free. You made a tactical error. That's what the enemy loves to do when you commit your life to Jesus Christ. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, how many of you know that sometimes, no, most often, a cleanup process takes place? The sins that we've committed, the failures that we've had, the people that we've hurt, a lot of times God will start cleaning that up, and as He begins to clean it up, we have to make some apologies and some restitutions. At least that's what happened in my life and almost everybody I've ever talked to that's given their life to Jesus Christ. There's been some restoration and cleanup that has to take place. And there's people who go, man, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe this was a tactical error because life was actually easier for me when I was in the world. And you know, Sometimes it is at the very beginning. Because we practice sin for so long, we are so good at it, that that's our natural response. And it's easy to go back into sin. It's easy to go back into those old habits. But it's still the wrong move. The right move is Jesus Christ. Paul knows that this is the right move. He knows that this is exactly what the Lord wants him to do. He wants to be there. Paul wants to be going through this. Paul wants to be in Rome. He wants to be in front of kings. And he wants to tell them about Jesus Christ. This is no mistake for Paul. This is exactly what he wants. Fifty men were chasing a preacher named Frederick Nolan. And they were chasing him through a hilly area in North Africa for preaching the message of repentance. He was trapped in a canyon and he saw the mouth of a cave. And he went inside and he rested inside of that cave. And he's laying in there in that shallow cave, exhausted, and he knows that within minutes he's going to be discovered. And as he lay there, praying, asking God what to do, a spider appeared and that spider began to quickly weave weave a web over the mouth of that cave completely covered the mouth of that cave 20 minutes later when the killers arrived five guys stopped at the opening of the cave saw the web and knew that he couldn't be in there So they went back and gave the order and all of them left him alone. He later wrote in his journal, he said, where God is, a spider web becomes a wall, but where God is not, a wall is like a spider web. I mean, where God is, a wall is like a spider web. We're able to stand, we're able to do the things that God wants us to do. Being in the will of God is the most important thing for us this morning. So guys, I'm just going to ask, are you almost? If you're just almost in the faith, why not make the step? Why not make the commitment? Persecution is going to happen no matter what. Our world is going to take a certain path no matter what. Don't you want to know that you're okay with God? Don't you want to know that your future is safe and secure?